Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's good to have you all with us. And welcome to another installment of The Rise of the Right and Real News' look at the coming elections. Now, I've been railing for a while about the lack of media or public strategy by Democrats. As we watch this meteoric rise of the right-wing racist power in this country that controls at least 22 state governments, it's changing voting laws, manipulating political districts, rolling back much of what people fought for in this country. So why is this happening? And more importantly, what do we do about it? We explore this today with Max Elbaum, who's been on the show many times before. He wrote this article called, Who's Got the Power? Balance of Forces 2023 for Convergence Magazine, where he sits on the editorial board. He's the author of numerous books like Revolution in the Air, 60s Radicals Turned to Lenin, Mao, and Jay. He's co-editor with Linda Burnham and Mario Poble of Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections, and has been an activist for many decades. Welcome back, Max. Good to see you. Great to be here with you, Mark. So th- let's talk a bit about th- what you wrote here. And I, I do want to start off with something that maybe you didn't write about, but allude to a lot in the work you're talking about of where we are politically in America and why you think the Democrats seem to lack any real organizing or media strategy to take on this growing right-wing power in this country. I think the Democrat, the Democratic mainstream, uh, led by Biden, uh, has a, a certain faith in the American system that they think is <clears throat> inherently democratic, and they've uh, also spent a tremendous amount of most of their political careers uh, working in tandem with the Republican Party, and they just have not really accepted the fact that the MAGA bloc is something different, that it has taken over the Republican Party and it constitutes a different kind of threat uh, to uh, the communities we care about, but even to the mainstream Democrats themselves uh, than we existed uh, in the 1970s or the 1980s. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of complacency there. Uh, I think that uh, it varies from individual to individual, uh, and some of them have various various moral uh, issues around why they are more or less committed to the fight against the right. But I think it's uh, American denialism, American exceptionalism. It can't happen here. Uh, They're wedded to that thinking. I mean, there was an article that you, I think you linked to in your article, that was in the New York Times. It was written by um, Jonathan Swan, uh, Charlie Savage, and, and Maggie Haber- Haberman, um, entitled Trump and Allies Forge Plans to Increase President's Power in 2025. When I read that article and read your article in Convergence, what's clear is that if Trump wins again, he intends to institute power like we've never seen before in this country. Uh, and in presidential power to dismiss people, dismiss civil servants, to take over agencies, to put things in place that will overturn the democracy that we have, you know, banning abortions, right to work laws, uh, and and, and numerous other things. I mean, that's what gets to me is that this is a real threat. This is not like the elections when we were kids, when we were younger, but this is an actual kind of assault on the entire future of this country, uh, in part brought on by the, the lack of will and policies from mainstream Democrats, but it's real, that's what we face. That, that's what I, frustrates me, that they don't seem to get. Yeah. Um, I, I, just to reinforce your point, uh, let me read you a quote uh, from the, uh, the main architect of this new Heritage Commission report, uh, which is uh, called uh, The Promise of America, the 2025 uh, Project Program for What Happens if Trump or Another Republican Wins in 2024. Uh, Project 2025 is not a white paper. We're not tinkering at the edges. We are writing a battle plan and we are marshalling our forces. Paul Dance, director of Project 2025 at the Heritage Foundation, told the E&E News. Never before has the whole conservative movement banded together to systematically prepare to take power day one and deconstruct the administrative state. To bring the 
uh, all federal agencies under direct presidential control, ending the operational independence, not only of the Department of Justice and the FBI, but also the Federal Reserve, the Federal Communications Commission, and the Federal Trade Commission, and the National, Libera uh, National uh, Labor Relations Board. They're very explicit. They want to dismantle all the programs of the 1960s and the 1930s, bring them under direct presidential control of a Republican president, reconstruct the state in the image of the authoritarian and fascist states of the 20th century and early 21st century. Uh, it is a bit mystifying how the mainstream Democrats are, are, don't see the level of threat. Um, I think part of it has to do with the constituencies. There's a certain you know, class complacency here. The biggest consequences of this will fall on the working class, on communities of color, on women, on youth who are looking for a future, on those communities in areas most affected by climate change and environmental problems. And uh, the mainstream Democrats, uh, their base uh, is a different class, a different layer of class forces. So they're opposed to MAGA, but they uh, concentrate on trying to figure out to the extent they have a strategy, how to persuade uh, people that they consider to be middle voters. Um, whereas the progressive wing, the left and radical wing, sees the importance of mobilizing and galvanizing and organizing into long-term uh, power building groups, the working class and the, the poor, the communities of color, uh, and building uh, powerful organizations with a strategy that not only talks about fear of MAGA, but offer something concrete, a restructured society that would be in the interest of those people. And uh, to the mainstream Democrats, that's not what they want. So they're hesitant about the left and complacent about the right. Let's talk a bit about your thoughts about it, what you see as an alternative and how you see that building. And where does that come from? Where does that power come from? Your, your whole writing around the block and build. Let's talk a bit about that. The block and build framework is that we need to block the right, uh, which includes uh, defeating MAGA candidates in elections up and down the line. But we needed to do so in a way that builds the independent power of social justice groups and those with an agenda for radical change. Uh, that's the build side of block and build. Uh, the book you mentioned, uh, Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections, that contains uh, 22 chapters within uh, 40 organizers who were on the ground in 2020 talk about how they approach the election to not just only uh, beat uh, Trump in 2020, but to build the power of the groups they worked with. So there were unions, groups like uh, Unite Here, SEIU, uh, the National Nurses Union, uh, workers groups like the National Domestic Workers Alliance, state-based power building groups uh, like Lucha in Arizona, Pennsylvania Stands Up, New Virginia Majority, uh, those kinds of organizations. Those are year-round organizations that have a membership. They do campaigning. They don't disappear after elections. They build up their membership, and they conduct issue-based campaigns in their states. Uh, Lucha in Arizona transformed Arizona from a right-wing bastion, which uh, in 20, 2010, was the center of gravity for the worst anti-immigrant uh, legislation in the country. Uh, they spent 10 years. In the course of that, they kicked out Sheriff Arpaio in Maricopa County, who was openly breaking the law in a racist manner. And they've transformed Arizona into a purple state and have started to elect their own people uh, to office there. So they're not in it just to defeat the Republicans and go back to uh, a Democratic Party that might offer a few concessions, but be basically a status quo party. They're out to transform and build power and make a real difference. Uh, I don't think it's an accident that in Minnesota and Michigan, 
where the new administrations, where the Democrats hold a trifecta, have initiated protections for abortion, uh, labor protections, all kinds of progressive legislation in those two states because the progressive wing, there are grassroots progressive organizations, Isaiah and others in Minnesota, uh, We the People Michigan, which has a chapter in that book, that have a base and are able to mobilize people. They have some of their own people in the state legislatures and uh, they make a real difference in people's lives. And then that's a springboard toward more victories going forward. So we don't, we can't be satisfied with blocking MAGA. We have to build independent strength in order to move the country in a different direction. Well, I remember that book that you wrote, and and I and um and this most recent article you've been that you wrote for Convergence in the last few weeks, and the the question is, is it even possible to stop, and how do you stop this kind of right wing wave in this country? without some kind of national convergence of the progressive world coming together with backers to kind of confront it? And do you see that happening? Um, well, I think that we are seeing the building blocks of that kind of coming together, uh, but it hasn't congealed yet. Uh, we definitely could use something like the Rainbow Coalition of the 1980s or the kind of block that the CIO centered in the 1930s, which was organized, coordinated, progressive forces that fought in both elections and outside the electoral arena, elected their own people, uh, were in an alignment uh, with more centrist forces to keep the fascists and the right out of power, but exercised their own influence and were able to coordinate work decide where there were priorities, allocate resources, uh, have coherent messaging. Uh, you know, the re Republican right uh, issues uh, talking points and within 20 minutes they're on Fox News and millions of people reach them. We don't have that kind of coordination. Uh, so we definitely need something like that. And there is more and more conversation uh, among the different components of the progressive uh, movement uh, that I think could lead and will, if we get the space in 2024, uh, will lead to something. Uh, it won't look exactly like the Rainbow Coalition, but it will look somewhat different, but it will serve the same function in American politics, which is there'll be a progressive poll with a mass base, a national structure, and a brand. Uh, coherent messaging. You know, in the 80s, people didn't just think, uh, oh, those were progressive Democrats. They were the Jackson people. Uh, like in the last few years, people talked about the Bernie Kratz. It had an independent identity and it could reach a broad mass of people. Um, unfortunately, out of Bernie's campaigns, that kind of thing did not emerge. Uh, but I think it's in the cards going forward. Uh, and we're the different forces who have a vision are trying to stir the pot and promote that kind of alignment building. One of the things I enjoy always talking with you and reading, your, reading what you write, uh, Max, is you do have that positive outlook. It can happen. It will happen. We'll make it happen. <laughs> and, I, and I think that it's an important message to bring out because we do face this rise, as I said earlier in the program, this, this rise of the right in this country. And if you look at the history of our country, there have been periods like the 30s to the 60s, the, the, the attempt at reconstruction, uh, the early 20th century where labor laws were being changed and the push was making place in this country to change things. Um, but, but then the right always comes roaring back and roaring back with, with intense power. And it seems that, that you know, when I, when I read, read the article in the Times that I, that I talked about earlier, that you can see the power of the MAGA right in this country with or without Trump, though clearly his message is about how he wants to increase authoritarian power uh, in this country are out there, but nobody seems to be using that against them. Yeah, uh, the rhythms of American history that you point out uh, are very sobering. Um, you know, for the first 60 years of this country as an independent country, the Southern slave, slave power was the dominant force in the country. They controlled the presidency most often. 
I mean, uh, we were chattel slavery. And it took years of the abolitionist movement's agitation from below uh, the coalition behind Lincoln, who was uh, not an abolitionist, but became one in the course of the struggle in order to defeat the Confederacy. Uh, and Reconstruction, which Du Bois called the dictatorship of the proletariat. This was the most uh, progressive state governments in U.S. history, overthrown by a combination of racist violence and disenfranchisement, the KKK. And then we get 100 years of Jim Crow. Jim Crow is overturned by the upsurge of the 1960s, and we're now living through the most dangerous phase of the backlash. Essentially, the Trump administration is just the latest phase of the backlash that started with Nixon's Southern strategy and Reagan's election. It's all proceeded through different stages, but we're, with, we're living through the backlash against the 1960s. The dilemma for the left has been that it has always, during the, during the abolitionist period, during the 1930s labor upsurge, when the Communist Party played an important role, and during the 60s upsurge, we were able to influence national politics. But in the wake of those victories in previous times, the right roared back, and the left was also under attack from the forces that had it, it had been allied with against their, in their earlier struggle against the right. We got pushed back. We got pushed out back to the margins. And that's the challenge today, how to beat MAGA in a way where we can't be pushed back to the margins, how to beat MAGA in a way that we develop a secure spot in mainstream politics, a mass influence, and we're able to take the initiative and become the leading force in the anti-right bloc uh, and force uh, the, our uh, erstwhile partners to either move with us or defect and to be strong enough to deal with their defection. Um, this is not easy. Uh, you know, uh, this has not been accomplished in any country. The revolutions that inspired so many of us and inspire people today all happened in countries uh, where there weren't uh, electoral systems. Uh, they were countries with very weak states that were either propped up by foreign domination or, as in Russia, czarism, uh, a very narrow social base. So making a transformation, a structural transformation in a country with the, the developed so-called bourgeois democracy, uh, this has not happened. Uh, so it's a tough job. There's no easy roads, uh, no preordained paths. Uh, we have to make that path. So, you know, when you see the, the power of the Heritage Foundation, what they're planning, how, how they are really kind of part of the intellectual force and part of the organizing force behind uh, the Trumpian MAGA right. Let's come back to, to what you were talking about earlier, uh, both what you wrote about in your book and what you see happening on the ground and where you see the forces of the progressive world in this country making the headway and, and, and how, that, how you pull them together nationally so there's some kind of, uh, not just a resistance, but victory against this kind of surge. Well, I think there are two important points there. Um, in 2018, 2020, and 2022 elections, what we saw was that there is a majority of people in this country that when MAGA candidates are on the ballot, they get defeated. They get defeated. The majority of people are not in favor of the MAGA agenda. And when they know that it's on the ballot, they'll vote against it. Uh, we won big victories in 2018. Uh, we kept Trump out in 2020. Uh, and in 2022, when everyone was expecting a, a red wave, they got the red wave in the red states and in states where the Republican candidates disguised themselves, but where MAGA candidates were on the ballot, they lost. So the first point is we have to uh, root ourselves the idea that we are the majority. We speak with the moral high ground of a majority that wants a different country. And the key constituencies, the growing constituencies in this country, young people and peoples of color, 
lean heavily in the progressive direction. Uh, the reason that the Republicans were defeated in 2018, 2020, and 2022 was not because a whole bunch of people changed their minds who had been voters. It's because many new voters, people who hadn't voted before, got mobilized. Uh, higher turnouts in 2018 and 2020, uh, and a tremendous youth vote, which leans two to one, much higher than uh, the older age cohorts in voting against MAGA. That's the source of our potential strength. And now we need to organize that strength. Uh, and the key things there, one, we have to revitalize those organizations that bring people together because of their structure, where they sit in the society, not just because they have a political view. In other words, labor organizations, unions, tenant organizations, community organizations, where people are part of something because they share the conditions of life of other people. Those have traditionally been the strong point for the left. The labor movement and the black church have been the anchors of the US left in historical periods. We have to revitalize those institutions. And then we have to build uh, organizations that are political organizations that can fight both electorally and non-electorally. And as you've pointed out, uh, uh, Mark, uh, they need to be, uh, they can't be siloed. They can't, they have to bring people together. Uh, they have to be able to function in a coordinated way. Um, those kinds of things have come together. The informal coalition behind Martin Luther King in the 60s, the Rainbow Coalition in the 80s, the CIO-led bloc in the 1930s. Um, there's a political space there. Politics like nature abhors a vacuum, and that political space is going to be filled. Uh, there's a whole range of groups. Uh, the national organizing networks like People's Action and CDP, uh, Community Change. Then you have groups like the Working Families Party, Progressive Democrats of America, Justice Democrats, DSA. Um, there's all kinds of conversations going on among these groups. And there's a revitalization going on in the labor movement. Uh, we just saw a big victory with the Teamsters uh, winning a big concessions from, U, uh, from UPS, the Teamsters under reform leadership, what's going on in the UAW. Uh, uh, the teachers unions are being more active because they're so under attack. The nurses union has a program called Nurse, National Nurses United has a Nurses for Democracy program. All these building blocks are in place. I, I wish I had a formula for how to bring them together. Uh, I don't have a formula, but compared to 2015 and 2016, there is a lot thicker interaction. And the prospects for that taking shape, I think are very good. I, I, I'm not sure it's gonna, something like that can come together before 2024 because People are already making their plans, and those groups that are engaged have made plans and set their priorities for different states, districts, and messaging. Uh, but I think if we can block MAGA in 2024, the prospects for a more united uh, progressive movement are uh, better than they've been uh, since the 1980s. Now, what you just said, before we conclude a little bit, I mean, this is a really, I think, important, a positive message about what can be done, how it should be done, and that we should be actually doing more to cover these organizations around the country doing this organizing, as Max Alvarez here has been doing with, uh, with covering all the, the labor struggles around the country. But when you look at the coming election, that would mean, following the logic that you posited, and this is a big debate, having to support the Democratic Party, having to support Joe Biden as president again, if in fact he is the candidate again. I mean, in order to stop MAGA from seizing power and the right wing from seizing power in this country. It's a really difficult situation. Yeah, it's a difficult situation. Um, I think that uh, two of the most savvy politicians on the progressive end of the spectrum in the United States today, we have a lot to learn from them. Bernie Sanders and Brandon Johnson, who was just elected uh, mayor of Chicago. Uh, both of them have endorsed Biden. 
Neither of them is a Biden fan. Uh, Bernie, however, uh, leveraged his strength in the 2020 election. He's the chair now of the Senate Budget Committee. Uh, he got some elements of his program into the Biden agenda. His, his strategic perspective is to set a working class anti-corporate pole within the broad anti-MAGA alliance and try to have people move into those networks of progressive organizations and not just vote a certain way. Voting is a part of it, uh, but then to move people in. Brandon, uh, who had 3% support in the initial polls and rose to win the election in Chicago, he ran against uh, a person who was nominally a Democrat, actually uh, more funded by the Republicans, a school privatizer, uh, somebody had ruined uh, school systems across the country, who was supported. Uh, in, Biden didn't take a position, but uh, some of the people close to Biden endorsed uh, Brandon's opponent, Paul Vallis, and the Obama, uh, leftover Obama machine in Chicago supported Vallis as opposed to Brandon Johnson. Brandon came out of the Teachers Union in Chicago, which is a key anchor of the progressive organizing networks in Chicago and has been for many years. Brandon won, turned around and beat Vallis, a uh, huge grassroots victory, uh, most important thing progressive in Chicago politics since Harold Washington in the 80s. And he turned around a week later and endorsed Biden for president. Why did he do that? Because he needs to be flanked. He knows that to get what he wants to change in Chicago, he has to have a relationship with the uh, mainstream Democrats. That MAGA will do, uh, if MAGA controls the federal government or the state government in Illinois, they'll do the kind of thing that the Republicans are doing in Texas, which is denying Houston the right to do anything, or Mississippi, where they've essentially taken control of Jackson, uh, the black majority capital uh, and forbid this using their power in the state government to basically disenfranchise the people from in Jackson from running their own affairs. Um, so uh, it's a question then of who gets the goods. You know, there's that saying, uh, who gets the bird, the hunter or the dog? Uh, there's a fight between us and the mainstream Dems about whether we're going to be the dog or we're going to be the hunter. Um, but we got to get the we got we, we got to get the we got to get the prey, and if the hunter and the dog don't work together, they don't get the prey. So we're stuck. Uh, we we can't beat MAGA without the centrist Dems, and the centrist Dems, for all the things that uh, you correctly pointed out, their complacency, they don't get it. They, targeting so-called median voter instead of realizing that you win elections by turning out people who are enthusiastic when you make something really happen for them. Uh, for all of that, they figured out that in most places, most of them have figured out that they need the progressives to win too. Uh, so that's why the Bernie Biden thing has held, uh, because Biden and uh, many people on his team may not like it, but they need the Bernie voters. So we have some leverage. We don't have as much leverage as we need. Uh, but that's, that's the way we have to work. Um, we have to build organizations on the ground. You know, if people are connected to an organization that they have confidence in and they've seen that it doesn't disappear the day after the election, they're, you know, they'll take the organization's guidance that it's be better for us to vote for the lesser evil candidate. Lesser evilism is only when all you do is vote for the lesser evil candidate and you don't try to build your independent power in the same time. Uh, if you're trying to build your independent power and you have an organization to do that, of course it's better for you uh, to have a less worse person. You know, uh, Charlene Mitchell, first black woman to run for president in the United States on the Communist Party ticket in 1968, when people, she always said, you know, worse is never better. <laughs> and she was right about that. Um, we can't settle for uh, the lesser evil. 
That's not a strategy. But voting for a less for a harm reduction candidate when you're building your independent power, that only makes sense. Uh, and we have got a lot to learn from people like Bernie and Brandon, who are on the front lines and know what the balance of forces in this country actually is. Uh, it's easy to criticize one or another position they take, but they're the people in the thick of the fight who uh, Bernie's probably more responsible than any other single individual. Uh, for revitalizing the idea of socialism in the United States in the last five or eight years. Um, so uh, we should, doesn't it mean we have to agree with him on everything or something like that, but we should learn something from uh, his savvy politics. Well, Max Elbaum, I hope there's been many conversations and what thing inspired me from our talk, A, there is a way out, B, that some of the groups you just, you described uh, we should be getting here on the Steiner Show to kind of take a deeper dive into groups that are organized around the country, uh, also to give inspiration to others saying we have to stand up. Uh, this this is our time not to allow the righteous to seize power. And I do appreciate the work you do and appreciate the time you always take when I call this. Let's have a conversation. So Max Elbaum, thanks for the work you do and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. I hope you enjoyed that conversation today with Max Elbaum, and we'll be linking to his article and more on the site, so check all that stuff out. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. And thanks to Cameron Grandino for being behind the glass and Keller Rivara for being behind the scenes to make all this happen. And please let me know what you think about what you heard today and what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com, and I'll write right back to you. And while you're there, please go to w www.therealnews.com forward slash support. Become a monthly donor. Become part of the future with us in this summer campaign. So for Cameron Grandino, Kelo Rivera, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.